Happy New Year and welcome to the first Mehdi Hassan show of 2023. And we begin the new calendar with a topic we covered heavily throughout 2022, the January 6th investigation, and more specifically, the role of Virginia Thomas, wife of Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, better known as Ginny. We learned in 2022 that Mrs. Thomas texted state lawmakers and even Trump's chief of staff, Mark Meadows, urging them all to overturn the election and keep Trump in office. But don't let the bland headlines downplay or even normalize what those texts represent. Those texts weren't the reasonable asks of a concerned citizen. Ginny Thomas's texts were unhinged, full of far-right conspiracy theories, like this message she sent to Meadows in November 2020, first obtained by The Washington Post, claiming the Biden crime family would be arrested and living in barges off Gitmo to face military tribunals for sedition. She also referred to watermarked ballots and a military white hat sting operation, both phrases often pushed by QAnon types. Later in the month, when Meadows tried to ease her concerns about the election results, Thomas replied, thank you, needed that, this plus a conversation with my best friend just now. We and others in the media speculated who that best friend could be. But now we can finally put all that speculation aside, thanks to the transcripts released by the January 6th committee over the holiday week, where Ginny confirms that her best friend is exactly who we thought it was all along, her husband, Justice Clarence Thomas. Surprise! See, Ginny Thomas did a voluntary sit-down with the committee in September. She wasn't subpoenaed. She wasn't under oath. <laughs> Did you speak with your husband and book your release of the election, Gene Swollen? <laughs> In the transcript of that interview, we see that Ginny Thomas is asked, do you recall who you were referring to when you said you had just had a conversation with your best friend? It looks like it was my husband, she says. The committee continues, do you remember what you talked to Justice Thomas about that made you feel better and allowed you to say, keep holding on? I wish I could remember, she responds, but I have no memory of the specifics. Later, the question, do you recall having any conversations with your husband about the fact that you were in contact with Mr. Meadows in this post-election time frame? Absolutely not, she says. He found out in March of this year when it hit the newspapers. He had no idea that I was texting Mark Meadows about the election. Now, we can all choose whether or not to believe Ginny Thomas when she says her husband didn't know about her texts. She claims she doesn't discuss her day-to-day -day work in politics with him, as he's apparently uninterested in politics. I choose to say, yeah, right. But even if you take her testimony at face value, the fact that she had a discussion with her husband, whom she calls her best friend, someone who helped her feel better, all while she was plotting behind the scenes to overturn a presidential election, it calls into serious question why Justice Clarence Thomas, the lone dissenter, you'll recall, when the Supreme Court allowed Trump's documents to be released to the 1-6 committee in an 8-1 to one vote, why Justice Thomas was and could still be hearing any cases related to Donald Trump or the 2020 election at all. Democrats should have acted on this months ago. Again, on this show, we pointed out that impeachment is an option. So what are Democrats doing about it now? Well, here's one six committee member Zoe Lofgren. Well, it did strike me as, uh, as wrong behavior. I think, based on this, that Justice Thomas would be well advised to recuse himself uh, from, from participating in matters that relate uh, to this. Ah, yes. Simply calling for him to recuse himself. Again. Something he's refused to do so far, and there's no reason to think he'll change his mind on that. Democrats have squandered an opportunity, an opportunity they had to impeach him when they controlled the House. They no longer have a majority in the House. That's now a non-starter. Good job, Dems. Now, there are some other interesting and important revelations from the Ginny Thomas transcript. She still believes there was fraud in the 2020 election, still believes it. When told by committee vice chair Liz Cheney that people like Attorney General Bill Barr and White House counsel Pat Cipollone told Trump there was no evidence of widespread fraud, Thomas doubles down on her election denialism, saying it wouldn't change her mind if she knew of those statements at the time. Quote, there's a lot of people uncomfortable with the 2020 election, despite what this committee is pushing. OK, she tells Cheney, I just think there's still concern. She later adds, I just think there's still a lot of things that are still being uncovered. And so I believe there was fraud and irregularity, contrary to clearly what you believe. 
bet you can't guess what she says when asked what her evidence for this fraud and irregularity was. Quote, I can't say that I was familiar at that time with any specific evidence, she tells committee member Jamie Raskin, who asked what the most significant case of voter fraud she was concerned about. When pressed later on, she repeats, she repeats, I don't have specific evidence of fraud. It was just a general belief that was motivating me at the time. In other words, I believe it, therefore it must be true. Facts be damned. But make sure the Biden crime family are locked up at Guantanamo, nevertheless. Ginny Thomas does have one regret, though. When asked if she regrets her text to Mark Meadows or if she regrets that they became public, Thomas says, I regret the tone and content of these texts. I wish I could have rewritten them. I wish I didn't send them. It was just an emotional time. Yeah. Despite everything Ginny Thomas told the committee in four hours of questioning, it wasn't testimony, despite everything we've seen in these texts, Ginny Thomas's name appears in the January 6th committee's final report exactly, let me see, one, two, three, zero times. No mention at all in over 800 pages. Somehow the wife of a sitting Supreme Court justice being involved in an attempt to undo a free and fair election, an attempt that resulted in the deadly attack on the Capitol, somehow that doesn't merit a spot in the final report. In the meantime, her husband remains on the highest court in the nation, ruling on cases not just related to the 2020 election, but cases that could change how our elections are conducted going forward, full stop. And that, that should be a national scandal. Joining me now is Slate staff writer Mark Joseph Stern, who covers the courts and the law, and former Republican congressional aide and never Trump Arena Shah, founder of the firm Relax Strategies, and of Republican Women for Biden. Thank you both for joining me on the show. Happy New Year to you both. Rena, let me start with you. What is your biggest takeaway from Ginny Thomas's testimony that we got hold of over the break? And where do we go from here in terms of accountability for her role in all of this? As I said earlier, she's not mentioned at all in the final 1-6 committee report. The biggest takeaway for me is power protects power. And for Liz Cheney, who by so many of us has been seen as this great patriot, somebody who really stood up and, and faced down some ugly ugliness of her own party and refuses to leave the party, why couldn't she go all the way? Why did it have to stop at Ginny Thomas? And to me, this is the real stark reality of our politics, is that nobody is really willing to go all the way anymore. There always has to be this caveat. It seems like, again, even with the people who we see as the, the loudest and, and the, the messengers who, who have the best things to say, like Liz Cheney, even they are sometimes not willing to put country over party. And that's the only takeaway I can take, I can glean from this, because Ginny Thomas, to me, d deserves to be behind bars. There was reporting uh, from last year that Liz Cheney uh, has a relationship with the Thomases and didn't want the committee to go too aggressively uh, after Ginny Thomas. Uh, Thomas, who, of course, denies any role in any kind of coup, denies that she's committed any kind of crimes. Uh, Mark, were you surprised to see Ginny Thomas concede that her best friend in those texts was almost certainly her husband, Justice Thomas? And were you surprised that she conveniently could not recall the content of her conversation with Clarence Thomas that day? You know, I, I actually was surprised that Ginny Thomas was honest enough to admit that she discussed uh, these matters, it seems, the 2020 election, her allegations of fraud with her husband, Justice Clarence Thomas. Um, you know, when those texts to Mark Meadows first came out, there was a lot of speculation when she referred to her best friend that she was talking about Clarence. She could have tried to kind of obfuscate on that, but she answered the question directly and uh, in doing so revealed beyond a shadow of a doubt that Ginny and Clarence Thomas were discussing uh, her own suspicions about fraud in the 2020 election while she was helping Trump's orbit plot the coup. Uh, and of yeah. course, we know that just a few months later, Thomas voted to shield documents from the January 6th committee. So she she made this big concession that I thought was was more than we would get from the, the testimony yeah. or the interview. And, and it was it was quite a remarkable feat for her to just acknowledge her husband was part of this conversation about the coup. Mm. She says in the transcript, Mark, 
He's not political at all, which is ridiculous to anyone who spent even 20 seconds looking at his career, his public speeches, and, of course, uh, his opinions on the court. Um, what I find most amusing is that she says he raised her spirit. She made, she made, it, he made her feel better that day, but he did it without asking her what she was stressed about, what she was talking to the White House about. He didn't want to know anything about her activities, apparently. OK, yeah, we'll, we'll believe that. Um, Rena, what's so interesting about this conversation and depressing is that when we talk about the Virginia Thomases of this world, a lot of the headlines, as I mentioned a moment ago, you know, they say, oh, she was involved in a scheme to try and overturn the election. She was texting lawmakers in Arizona or wherever it was. But it was so much worse than that. She was pushing QAnon-type conspiracy theories. She was referring to a Biden crime family being locked up at Guantanamo Bay. That is deranged stuff, which a lot of people in your party or former party, I'm not sure what your current status is, is, sadly believe now, increasingly by the day. Yeah, Betty, I, I've chosen to stay in the Republican Party as a reformer. You know, we don't have a multi-party system here. We have two parties. And I, I believe that for a healthy democracy, we need two healthy parties. And we don't have a healthy party in the Republican Party today. I mean, it's just obvious. Look from Capitol Hill to the executive branch when Trump was the occupant there. And even the Supreme Court, there are too many people who are taking their personal ideologies and trying to legislate with them. You know, when I was growing up, a young girl in southern West Virginia uh, you know, it wasn't the people around me that shaped my ideology. They weren't the people that made me click for Republican. I thought the Republican Party was a freedom-loving party. It was a party that was going to stand up for American values, the values that brought my parents to this country. And I thought that the justice reigned supreme here, that justice and the letter of the law, this this was all really important stuff. My parents as immigrants would tell me all the time, in other parts of the world, we just don't have what we have here. So it was really important to me because it's woven into the fabric of what I really yeah. believe. And to watch people in the party that I made my career in and, and still try to reform today, talk about the Biden crime family on a regular basis, that kind of stuff is just so disassociated from reality that I, I've got to wonder how we stop this. And I think the only way to stop it is to hold the high, the people in the highest positions of power to account. But again, the Ginny Thomases, they just consider themselves these low-level activists, yet they're pulling all the strings they possibly can. She was texting anybody in her yeah. Rolodex that she thought had power, people who were lawyers. I mean, this is just beyond the... It's just incomprehensible to me that it's this has not seen law enforcement. It's interesting to hear you talk about kind of how you became a conservative uh, growing up, because I was talking to some friends over Christmas and I was making this point that in the old days, you know, I'm a, anyone who knows me knows I'm a critic of conservatism, critic of the Republican Party. But in the old days, you could have a legitimate debate over should the tax rate be higher or should the tax rate be lower? Today, the political debate is, do you believe Hillary Clinton was operating a pedophile cabal in a pizza restaurant basement or do you believe Joe Biden's family should be locked up at Guantanamo Bay? That is not normal political debate. And to know that the wife of a Supreme Court justice is peddling this stuff uh, at the yeah. highest levels of government. Mark, how is it that Justice Clarence Thomas isn't under any real pressure to recuse himself? We played Zoe Lofgren a moment ago uh, saying he should recuse himself. A few Democrats here and there have said that. None, as far as I'm aware of, maybe AOC, off the top of my head, have called for his impeachment back in the day. Obviously, the House is now controlled by the Republicans. That's not happening. But where is the outcry from the Democratic Party, from sections of the quote-unquote liberal media, that Justice Thomas is ruling on cases involving Trump, involving the election, involving future elections? Well, you know, I think partly this is a fundamental flaw in the American democratic system. We love to praise the Constitution as divinely inspired, but the reality is that the men who wrote it were mortals who simply did not envision that someone as corrupt as Clarence Thomas would ever sit on the Supreme Court and refuse to recuse himself from cases in which his own wife tried to overturn the election and nullify millions of votes. And because there's no real chance of him being removed, I mean, he'd have to be impeached and then voted the two-thirds of the Senate to remove, yeah. I think Democrats have decided to just save their energy, save their breath. And outside of a few who are very activated on the courts, like uh, Ocasio-Cortez, they don't think this is a battle worth fighting. They think they should keep their powder dry for other areas where they're willing to really leave it all on the field. But I will tell you that Nancy Pelosi for all of her, her wonderful attributes, she really put on kid gloves when it came to the courts. She yes. was not willing to go all in on dealing with the conservative Republican takeover of the courts. Hakeem Jeffries is different. He is of a different generation. He is, of course, the new Democratic leader in the House. And he has spoken eloquently and 
fiercely about Justice Clarence Thomas's corruption and about his desire to root out broader corruption and partisanship in the judiciary. So I think Democrats are waking up to the fact that they need to talk about this and address it directly, but they're still stumped by the lack of options for direct yeah. action, and they're feeling their way towards some kind of consensus that'll let them move next time they regain power in the House and the Senate. We know that Nancy Pelosi almost mocks the idea of expanding or rebalancing the court. We know that Joe Biden set up a commission on the court and then kicked it, you know, kicked the can down the road when some members of that commission were saying, well, let's talk about expanding the court, although the majority uh, didn't say that. It's a real problem. I should remind our viewers at home that the Supreme Court, uh, Mark, correct me if I'm wrong, is the only court in the country that doesn't have to abide by any kind of external ethics code. Uh, they are self-regulating, and that's worked out wonderfully. Uh, Rena, not only have we seen a lot of transcripts released by the 1-6 committee, we're also now seeing some interesting text exchanges uh, also being released, including one between Trump advisor Hope Hicks, long-standing Trump advisor Hope Hicks, and Ivanka Trump's chief of staff, Julie Radford, on January the 6th itself. In an apparent reference to Trump, Hicks says in one day he ended every future opportunity that doesn't include speaking engagements at the local Proud Boys chapter. Radford replies, yup. Hicks says, and all of us that didn't have jobs lined up will be perpetually unemployed. Uh, my tiny violin is going off right now. Hicks goes on, I'm so mad and upset. We all look like domestic terrorists now, you think? Radford says, oh, yes, I've been crying. Uh, I've been crying, she says. Later on, Hicks says, WTF is wrong with him, which, Rena, I find ironic, and I'm sure you as a never-Trumper must find ironic. We're, what, seven <laughs> years into Donald Trump's public political career, and Hope Hicks is saying, well, six years, 2021, Hope Hicks is saying, WTF Donald Trump. She never asked that question before. And while people are dying at the Capitol, she's worried about her future employment opportunities. And it tells you exactly who these people are and who they've always been. And look, Never Trump is not a label I ever asked for myself. I did it by doing the right thing in 2016 and opposing him as the first ever Republican National Committee delegate to do so. Uh, and it's a badge of honor because, look, I've been vindicated. I tried to warn people about who this madman was. I told him he's a con man. In my family, we can spot dictators a mile away. We lost everything in Uganda because of one on my dad's side. So, look, here I am sitting in a moment where I, I have no sympathy for anybody who went into the Trump administration. I want to be very clear here. Yeah, I might be in the same sandbox with some of these people, but they always knew who he was. If you went in, you knew who you were going to work for, okay? And Hope Hicks, she's better off with a career at the Saks makeup counter. This woman is really, un, she has no credibility, and she has she should garner no sympathy from anywhere because she was never conservative. She was never about the Republican agenda. She was always about Hope Hicks's agenda, and she knew what kind of man she yeah. worked for. So those texts are just obscene to me. These are people who want to be seen in the history books as decent, honorable people. You're not honorable when you're near that guy, and that guy being the 45th president of the United States, who should be nowhere near the Oval in 2024 and onward. Indeed. And, uh, you know, it's it's ironic when you hear people like uh, Ted Cruz apologizing for referring to 1-6 insurrectionists as terrorists and Tucker Carlson getting very upset about using the language of terrorism. Here's Trump's own people on the day itself saying we look like domestic terrorists. Well, indeed. Mark, last question to you. The 1-6 committee did criminally refer both Donald Trump and his lawyer, John Eastman, uh, to the Justice Department. Do you expect the DOJ in 2023 to act on those criminal referrals? And did the committee make enough referrals? Should there have been more names added to their list of criminal referrals? You know, certainly I had my own wish list, but I think the committee <laughs> took a big and bold step by making those referrals that it did. And I would say it's a really close call on whether the Justice Department will follow through on them. Frankly, you know, Obviously, these main players committed crimes. They are difficult crimes to prove in a court of law. They involve these elements of criminal intent and criminal conduct that are going to be, I think, fairly easy for, for Trump and his, his Confederates to claim they couldn't possibly satisfy because, you know, they were just at the top saying stuff, tweeting stuff. They weren't the ones invading the Capitol. They weren't the ones planning the step-by-step -step insurrection. The Justice Department does not like to bring cases it can't win. And and so I think you're going to have a lot of long-term career prosecutors really worried about bringing some relatively novel charges against high-ranking officials and their allies and saying, you know, if we can't prove this and we fail and we get an acquittal, we will do far more damage to the January 6th committee than if we didn't bring charges at all. Although one quick follow-up, Mark, while I've got you. There were two specific crimes, if memory serves me correctly, that Donald Trump uh, is supposed to be referred for. 
The incitement to violence, I get what you're saying, it is very hard to prove, but the obstruction of a congressional proceeding, that seems fairly open and shut. He sent a crowd to the Capitol to stop the vote, and he wanted to go too. Yes, I agree. Um, I think if you look at the individual elements of that crime, it gets a little more confusing and nuanced than that. The prosecutors would have to prove to a jury of lay people um, that he had the specific intent to send those folks actually into the Capitol to somehow physically perhaps uh, obstruct the proceeding, to somehow grind it to a halt in a way that, you know, he never explicitly said, we all know it's what he wanted. That's what's frustrating about this conversation. We all know that they did what he was designed desiring, but I don't know if prosecutors would be able to get their intent across the finish line to a jury of folks who have never heard about this stuff, who don't have yeah. law degrees, who get confused in the midst of all this legalese. I certainly don't have a law degree, and it's because of what you just said that I probably could never get one.